Time to review the Jack and Jill Marathon 2023. I'm making this video because I recently ran the Jack and Jill Marathon in Washington, USA. And I wanted to review the race and show you what it might be like to run it. This video will be long, so there are chapter markers down below so you can skip on through to the bits you might be interested in. Let's get going. My journey started at home in Dublin, Ireland, getting the taxi to the airport. It was actually quite quick. I think I ordered my taxi at 11.45. I was through security, according to the watch that you might see in the B-roll I'll show, at 12.09, so it was very quick. Part of that was, on this particular trip, I decided to fly in business class. Aer Lingus fly direct from Dublin to Seattle. They're the only airline that do. And I was really conscious of a nine hour flight and the effect that might have on me. So I, I pushed the boat out and went business, which I wouldn't usually do. The advantage of that is once you get to the airport, check-in is really quick. I did my usual photograph in my bag before it disappeared. And then I went upstairs to go through security. You go through security if you're in business on Fast Track, Grant Norton's Fast Track, it's really quick. I'm um, again, I was through in no time, but I carry a lot of stuff. I carry, um, all sorts of i made a packing video so you probably saw some of the stuff but i bring a lot of filming equipment and i bring a lot of running equipment and a lot of lycra and and tech and the tech goes in my carry-on bag so i think i had four or five gopros and insta 360 uh, endless adapters and cables and tripods and all sorts of wires and things i always expect that they'll go through the insecurity in dublin the only thing that they seem to uh, taken interest in was they couldn't figure out what my dead cat was which is my microphone muffler but that's uh, recording over there but they um, yeah I got through security very easily the great advantage of flying Dublin to the USA I think it might also be Shannon in Ireland as well is you pre clear American customs and immigration before you leave the airport so you do that in Dublin an oddity is you go downstairs and uh, you then usually go through a second security check for going to the States. But somehow or other, if you're in business, you don't go through the security check. I don't understand what the logic of that is, but that's what it was. And then you're through pretty easily. Flights to America mostly go in the morning and uh, the terminal is very, very busy. But again, because it's business, I went down to the lounge, the 51st and State and I went in there. I filmed it before in previous videos, but it's fairly standard. There's, um, it's, it's pretty nice. The great thing about the, um, the, the area is this great view onto the apron. You can see the planes coming and going, and that's one of the nicest things. Um, I'll show a picture of Aer Lingus. <laughs> Every year around St. Patrick's Day, I get angry at Brooks and Saucony for their St. Patrick's Day kind of shoes where they're, they've got four leaf clovers, look at the early lingus symbol. You'll clearly see what a shamrock is, three leaves, anyway. Aer Lingus fly an A330 to the United States. If you're in business class, if you go on the right-hand side of the airplane, in 3K and 5K, there are what are called the throne seats. They sit behind and in the middle of, of, of two seats and your legs go between the, the two passengers ahead of you. But it means you have a huge amount of storage and layout space if you want to have a, a laptop open, make videos and do all that kind of thing. The disadvantage is that the tunnel is quite narrow. I have short legs and there isn't a lot of wriggle room for me. And certainly I couldn't put, put my feet in with the shoes on, I take a size 12 UK US 13. So it's kind of narrow in there, um, but if you're short legged like me and you want to make videos, it's not a bad choice. Otherwise, perhaps the other side is pretty good. Other than that, it was all straightforward. The service was really nice. People were friendly, um, but the, the cabin is a bit dated. And so the TV, you kind of, when you lie down and you look up at the TV, it's a bit, you can't see the colors just as well. But it was fine. It was a, a nine hour flight. We uh, flew in just over Seattle, it was lovely. I mean, you fly in over, over the sound and you can see down into the central business district. You can see the football stadium, the baseball, T-Mobile Park, the baseball stadium. And uh, very nice view in, easy landing. 
one of the things I always find strange when I, when I arrive in the States, I just find this really unusual and uh, as a European arriving in, in that when you fly domestically in the United States, and if you're flying from Ireland on, uh, into the States, you're treated as domestically because you're pre-cleared, um, you, you land and your baggage just comes out into an open area where anybody could kind of take it and, 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 and uh, just walk away with it. I find that really strange, but it is what it is. My bags came out. Because it was about, I don't know, five o'clock in the evening or something when we landed at local time, I decided that I would stay locally in, a, in an airport in a hotel in the Crown Plaza, which was a short walk away. It was fairly easy to figure out. You walk through the, the parking garage. The <laughs> parking garage is, if you're an old architect like me, kind of, kind of like it, but I think for most people, the, the sort of endless concrete ramps mightn't be so attractive. But it's a very easy airport to get in around, very easy to go and stay in. Uh, hotels nearby. One of the things I wanted to do was to stay on local Irish time. Now the reason for that was the race was starting at six o'clock in the morning, in theory. It was a bus at four o'clock in the morning to get to the race start and I would need a half hour drive to get to that and it just made an awful lot of sense to stay on Irish time so that I would wake up naturally without feeling I was getting up early in the morning to do a run and that actually worked really well but yeah I got a, a little bit of rest it turns out I have a, a back injury I won't go on too much about it hopefully but uh, yeah that meant that when I came off the plane I was uh, even though I'd been in business class uh, I found even walking a struggle and I was saying to myself gosh will I, will I get this run done um, I figured I would but I, I, I really was uh, bent out, out of shape when I got off the airplane I flew on a Tuesday to give me plenty of time before the race on the Saturday. On the Wednesday morning, I went to hire a car. I had, because of the various issues I was having, I did, I did some preparations. I wasn't sure I could make the race. So I left some preparations a bit later than I otherwise would. I would usually book a car at Hertz because if you sign up to one of their free gold things or one of these things, you, you often get to choose the car when you get there. I'm interested in tech, so I would arrive at a hire car. Uh, rental place at Hertz and spend ages picking out which car had the best tech but it turned out Hertz had no cars so I, I booked sixth and I would have preferred to book an American car I mean America um, but I ended up with some sort of BMW X3 which was fine I know how to use it so um, it wasn't difficult and it was very easy hiring cars in America is, is pretty easy and then head out on the highway to Issaquah I stayed in Issaquah, and I will point out, I don't know how to pronounce everything properly. So, so I was making these pronunciations up. But I went to Issaquah. There was, again, there was um, various hotels on the website um, of the race, and there was one uh, which, I, which I probably would have preferred to stay in, in Snoqualmie, but that sold out pretty early, and again, I was leaving things late. And so I stayed in the Hilton Homewood Suites in Issaquah. It was pretty nice. Um, one of the things I wanted to do was to and uh, try to do any time I'm practicing for a marathon or preparing for a marathon is stay somewhere where I've got somewhere where I can cook various different things. Uh, by cook, I mean microwave. Um, somewhere where I can heat up uh, oatmeal, somewhere where I can heat up pasta, that sort of stuff. So I made a trip to Walmart on the way, got sort of the usual provisions that I would get and arrived in the Hilton Homewood Suites. It was pretty nice. The rooms were big, huge. Uh, in fact, um, but there's not a lot of light, so there was only one window, and that, if you're going to be staying somewhere for two or three days, can be a bit limiting. So, yeah, I probably would have preferred to stay in the Snoqualmie uh, hotels, but anyway, it, w it was fine. There was a, a, a pool and all that sort of stuff, and it was very easy to relax in, so no real complaints there. It's a relatively short drive, about 15, 20 minutes, from Issaquah to North Bend, where the race ends. It was, uh, so I decided to uh, prepare a couple of days in advance. I wanted to go up and see the start, the finish, as much of the course as I could, so I had an idea of, of what I might have to expect. Um, I went into North Bend, and uh, you come, there's an old movie theater, and they were playing Jaws in a sort of Art Deco movie theater. And for some reason, as soon as I saw this, I just came around the bend, saw this, and suddenly thought of Kyle MacLachlan and uh, Blue Velvet, which is one of my favorite uh, films. And uh, I suddenly thought of that. And then, I don't know, I wandered through the town and uh, then I, I, was, I suddenly w was looking and I realized that this was the town that 
some of Twin Peaks was shot in. And I'd read something about that many, many months ago, but I'd completely forgotten about it until I wandered into town and suddenly I thought I had visions of Kyle MacLachlan wandering around the place. It's a beautiful little town. Um, there weren't any, but any places to stay in the town that were listed on the website. I think there might be a motel. I think I saw a motel as I was going by. Um, but I ate in the, the coffee shop in which uh, Twin Peaks is set. I did that. Uh, Tweedies, I think it is. And I just wandered around the town. It was really nice. Um, <laughs> I, I, I kind of was somewhat surprised when I got to Seattle at how many different IPAs there are, and I, I like IPAs, I won't, I won't lie, they've been my favorite, my beer of beer of choice, and uh, they have so many of them, and they're so strong, couldn't believe the strength of these things, so, uh, and I was panning through, and I'm trying to make a film, I saw, I saw one called Irish Death, <laughs> and I thought, wow, is that an omen for my marathon, but yeah, I went to North Bend, and it was a very attractive town. I arrived at Meadowbank Farm, maybe it's Meadowbrook, which is where the cars that were to be parked. It's very beautiful, very peaceful. It's about, I think, four miles, 4K, 5K, 6K, something like that, from the finish line. And the idea was that you would get a bus from the finish line back to the farm where the cars would be parked. So again, I went to see what it would be like and see where the cars might be parked. I then drove up to the start line. So and you go up and you go through the valley and uh, you, I'll show some clips from the car with the, the head cam on. And uh, I, I was very careful to make sure I had the exact speed limit when I was filming that. Uh, I didn't go over it. So I, w I went up through the valley. It was, very, it was really very attractive. And you're sort of going up, realizing that you'll be running down backwards in a couple of days' time. So I went up. You go up to Hayak. And uh, so in the, so the race starts in a place called Hayak. And very shortly afterwards, it goes into Snoqualmie Tunnel, which I'll go through. But effectively, um, you can park. It's 10 bucks a day for a Discover Pass to, to park. If you've Discover Pass, to park for free. Um, and I guess some people must probably drive to the start line, and then there's probably a car at the end, and they can shuttle back. But for everybody else, you use a bus. But there's plenty of parking at Hayek, and there's some toilets there and stuff like that. So I kind of went there, and then I went down to see the start line. So 400 meters after the start line, you come to probably the unique feature of this race, which is you run through the Snoqualmie Tunnel. I went in and practiced <laughs> goofing around in the tunnel, which I, I really did enjoy. But as I came towards the tunnel, um, and this was about uh, midday, I, I noticed, maybe it was a bit later, but I noticed the sun was up, well up anyway, but I, I could feel cold sort of emanating out of the tunnel. And I, I'd gone there specifically to see what sort of kit I wanted to wear on the day. And I planned to wear a vest and I was wondering would it be cold. And uh, yeah, well, you could feel, it was like cold seeping out of, of this eerie tunnel. And um, I go into the tunnel and the tunnel is about two and a half miles long, something like that. I think it's a bit shorter, but I'm not exactly certain, but it's two to two and a half miles long, I think. And, and you go in and it's, it's dark. And some of the photos made it look much brighter than it actually was, the, the camera exposure. But I'm kind of moving in above my head and I can see another light above his head. And I think, well, there's a guy over there or so somebody. And, and you're kind of in this long tunnel. And anyway, eventually I realized <laughs> when I stopped bobbing my head, I realized that the, what I saw as a piece of light is actually the light at the end of the tunnel because it's straight through the mountain. And um, that was kind of interesting. So I went up and down, did a few uh, tests on that of, 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 of shoes. Of, of, I'll come to kit later, but I was testing some shoes and, and stuff. And uh, then I returned later in the afternoon when I when, when I ran. Uh, I wanted to go for a run anyway, a sort of warm up run. And I decided the best thing was to run through the tunnel and then turn around and come back and see what that was like. That was a very good idea, I think, to do because um, I could see the tunnel water drips down. That's the first thing. And so I was going to be running wearing a, a cap anyway, but, but water drips down. But in a race, that probably it, it, it's, it's not a huge amount of water, but there are puddles and there are some parts of uneven ground in the tunnel. So by running the, the practice route, I knew that if I stayed on the left hand of the center line, I'd be OK. And I also knew that if there was a lot of jockeying for position, which it can be at the start, of a race that could be problematic so I was kind of interested how that might pan out I was not going to be jockeying for position on this particular race I was just trying to run it and treat it as a, as a long training run but yeah I was interested to how that would pan out but it was a, I really did enjoy running in the tunnel largely on my own I, I, I really it was something that I, I really did and found it really special and of course get out the other end and you see the lovely valley 
and then came back. So I did that to prepare for the race. Having looked at the tunnel, I went to look at the finish line again to see how much of, of, of the trail I could see. The race is on a trail. You'll see that there's lots of running footage, but it's on a trail. I think at one point in time, maybe we crossed uh, a, a road crossing, but I think that, that might be the half marathon stage, but there's very little access to the trail in terms of points if you wanted to go, go and stop and have a look be beforehand. There aren't that many. So I was able to film the start and film the end and the either side of the tunnel. But other than that, I was sort of guessing what it might be like. I knew there might be some trestle bridges. I knew that it, the, there's a descent or there's a, a grade drop of about two and a half thousand feet over the, the run, which I think is about one in 60. So there was a sort of gentle downhill run. And so I pretty much knew that. The run is from uh, at your back, the sun, it's really good in terms of when the sun comes up, it's at your back. So you run from uh, east to west. The sun at your back is a really good idea. There was no wind on the course that I noticed at any stage, but having the sun at your back is really good because your eyes aren't getting glare. And um, yeah, the sun is coming up pretty much all the time. The race was due to start at six o'clock. I think sunrise was 5.30 something like that it starts in in uh, it's it's light when it starts and uh, i was due to finish at about if it was four hours i finished about 10 o'clock at which point i think the temperature it's the temperature was set to be 11 degrees and it was supposed to be about 24 when we finished and the, the the weather forecast for all the days up to and since was very stable so yeah it was going to be warm at the, at the finish but uh, not too bad at the start maybe a little on the cold side and along the way, I wasn't sure how much shade there would be. I knew there was lots of trees. I thought there must be some shade, but there's long stretches where you're running straight and there's very little shade. So I had to put sun cream on before I actually headed off in the morning. The bib pickup is in the Nike store in North Bend, or I say in, it's just outside the Nike store. There's a series of outlet stores there. They look predated actually, but there's, there's a couple of outlet stores and the bib pickup is outside. It was pretty straightforward. I, if, I think it was on at 11 o'clock on the Friday. I turned up at 11, picked up my bib uh, pretty easily and uh, headed back to essentially get some rest and not be wearing out my legs. As it happened because of my back problem, I, I got a lot of pain relief by actually walking. I needed to walk an awful lot in order to, if I sit, it's, it's problematic. So I was trying to balance this idea of resting, but uh, um, not, not tightening up and that was a uh, tricky enough balance but yeah certainly on the Friday every other day I did 10 to 20,000 steps and uh, on the Friday again I probably did 10,000 steps but largely in around collecting my bib and doing a couple of things but uh, yeah and then I relaxed again I'm staying on Irish time so I was in bed by six o'clock in the evening. Race day I woke up without any bother um, I slept okay. I must have got up about one or I think about one o'clock in the morning and I did my usual pre-race ritual. I drank my Nescafe Go Blend coffee. I ate my oatmeal. I, I took my Morton. I took Morton the night before, uh, the drink mix. And so, yeah, everything sort of went well. I went down into the car. It was dark. I had practiced a couple of nights uh, previously. Again, I stayed on Irish time. I got up and, uh, and gone outside at that time of night to figure out how cold it might be because I was going to be running in a vest and I wanted to see whether I, I would need to bring any additional sweatshirts and have a, a, a drop bag or any of that. I don't usually like doing that and so I didn't do that. I decided I'd, I'd tough it out in, in the vest. One thing I noticed was when you went out at about um, two o'clock in the morning or whatever, it was actually warmer than I got to four o'clock in the morning. So it actually gets colder down to the very time I was going to be getting out of these buses uh, or getting into these buses in, in my vest. But I figured, ah, it wouldn't be too bad. Uh, I would I would just make it work and run around if I had to. So I, uh, I had practiced the kind of temperatures and all that stuff in advance. And on the day, I sort of then went down into the car and headed out and I tried to see what I think might would happen and try and record a piece of camera in the, uh, on, the, on the drive on the way out, which I'll, I'll show here. So how's it gonna go? Well, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm heading out, I feel good. I know that I have a serious uh, problem that I'm working through that I've had since the start of May, it's now the end of July, and the physio says I have another couple of months of, of, of rehabbing. Um, but I got the good, I got the green light from my doctor and my physio to run. 
And when I'm running, I'm not in any pain. I'm in pain when I'm sitting for extended periods. And certainly in the car yesterday, I was in real pain by the time I got out of it. When I got here, I was looking at the TV and I saw these commercials, daytime American TV. There's always commercials for what I used to call old people, but you know, <laughs> you turn into one. And uh, you know, you're watching one and it was an advert for a type of medicine that they were saying was great for back pain. So I nipped down to the pharmacy. I mean, I, I would try anything. I would listen to Alan from Two and a Half Men if I thought it would make my back feel better. But I went down and I bought this, which was a mixture of uh, ibuprofen and I think the active ingredient in Tylenol. It's acetaminoprofen or something like that. I, I mean, that's not it, but it's something like that. And actually, <laughs> I felt great. When I took it, I felt great. Now, initially when I got my back problem and I took ibuprofen, I didn't, I, it was just not good at all. But anyway, uh, this stuff and but really it's down to the physio the physio and uh, some of the doctor helping identify the problem and then the physio so yeah so uh, today really what I'm trying to do is treat this like a very long easy training run a bit like the run I did last year when I did the virtual New York Marathon in Ireland and I just ran for five hours stopping to pet dogs and do whatever I felt like and I'm gonna try and treat it that way so yeah that's my plan for today See how it turns out. I drove into Meadowbank Farm in the dark. It turned out that where I thought I was going to park wasn't. I was going to be parking in a field a bit beyond. I think there was three or four people there before me. I arrived at maybe 3.40 in the morning and, and the first bus, bus was supposed to leave at four. Um, but it was kind of hard to figure out where we were supposed to park. It was very well, pitch black and uh, a bit of mist here and there. And uh, it was really hard to figure out where it was to park. You could see sort of random arrows, but eventually we figured it out, parked the car. I mean, it was a big open field. You could have probably parked anywhere, but I was kind of conscious of, of blocking somebody in or blocking something or, or whatever. But eventually, anyway, I found some lines, parked the car and made my way over to the farm where I could see some light. And uh, I tried to test it a little bit at running, realized I'd forgotten my hat, went back and a few things like that. And then there was a line of school buses, <laughs> which it was great. I, I, I thought it was really exciting going on these school buses. And so they all lined up and then at about four o'clock, 4.10, something like that, we got into the bus for the drive up, up the valley and to the start line at Hayak. And uh, yeah, I really did enjoy that part of it. When we got to Hayak, just before we got to Hayak, and I think it must be about half an hour journey, something like that. I was uh, on the bus thinking, wow, I sat at the back. Maybe I should have sat at the front because as soon as the bus arrived, and it's, I was on the first bus, as soon as the bus arrived, everybody bailed out to try and go to the restrooms. And the restrooms, there was, I think it was about six, three each side, and there was like 40, 50 people on this bus. So you get out and there's a huge queue. Now it's pitch black. So I did what I recommend anybody who doesn't need to sit down does, and that's find a, a piece of nature and, and away you go. And uh, but a lot of people were just queuing, and and then more and more buses were arriving. There were some uh, porta cabins or porta potties, or whatever they call them here, and uh, but they were all zip tied up, shut, and and that took a while before it took about 10, 15, 20 minutes before someone came and undid those, which which was not ideal. But pro tip, it turns out that. If you go beyond the start line, about three or 400 yards, there's actually two little cabinets, uh, a sort of parking area, which had toilets and nobody was using those. So uh, yeah, when you get there in the future, if that's what you want to do, those were, were perfect. And it sort of ran up and down trying to check out uh, conditions and trying to warm up. It was very cold. Well, it wasn't very cold. It was cold. I mean, it was, but when I was running up and down, it was fine. A couple of people were wrapped in space blankets and and things like that. I was probably the only person in a single that I saw for a very long period of time. And people wore all sorts of things. Eventually, by the time the race kicked off, there were some people who weren't wearing any tops and there was, um, there was a wide variety, but not very many people were in singlets. I did what I always do before a marathon. I, I wanted to look at what people were wearing. What's, what, what sort of shoes? Because I'd been going through a lot of, of wondering about the shoes. Now, there is a lot of gravel on, on the trail, and I did see that the day before, and I, I specifically wasn't running for performance and left a lot of my um, vapor flies, alpha flies, those kinds of shoes behind. I didn't want to pick up gravel uh, if, if, if 
gravel wasn't an issue, I probably would have run in, in, in my Alpha Fly 2s. And there were various people in Alpha Fly 2s, various Alpha Flies and Vapor Flies. They were the predominant uh, shoe, shoes that I saw, but I pretty much saw every shoe that I had. I saw someone in a Cloud Boom Echo, I saw someone in a Cloud Stratus on shoes, and I thought, wow, they're gonna pick up gravel. Uh, and then I saw, people in the, the shoe I saw that I that I really did think I, I said this in the previous video the ultra vanish carbon I think would have been a really good shoe for this run I saw one person in in those and I was in my new balance uh, vective pro I didn't see anyone in it in the same pair of shoes but I picked them because I wanted a reasonable stack height but not too high and I wanted carbon plate for energy return and they, they were fine I'll come to gear, gear later but but I I was kind of looking around I did see quite a few people with um shoes so i'll show a picture of, of somebody with a shoe i think that these are vapor flies or not a half flies i think these ones are and they had um a, a a gator on 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 them to stop gravel coming in that wasn't a problem on the race i didn't find any stones or anything like that coming in i th the shoes were very dusty by the time i was finished but that was that was the only uh, that was the only thing I noticed with the shoe was was it got very dusty. But these Nikes with the with the gaiters, a lot of people did that, and uh, um, probably for me that would have been un unnecessary. The, the the shoe would have been fine. The start got delayed. It was supposed to be at six a.m., but it was pushed out to six twenty. Um, there were various waves, so there were three or four waves. I think I was in the third wave. There was four waves. One of the odd things was, so I was talking to a guy um, who was going to run on the Saturday and on the Sunday. The race is on two days. And he was going to run Saturday and he was going to try and run on Sunday. And he wanted to check whether the time he would be given was on chip time or gun time. So uh, if he was in the fourth wave and it was on gun time, then he was going to lose a bit of time. And what he was afraid of was missing the cut um, and the race not being, being being disqualified from the race. And that was on his mind for, for very good reasons. He wanted to run, uh, uh, he was trying to run, I think his 50th marathon within a certain period and, and he needed these two to, to do that. And, and so that's why I was doing it. But he, he certainly felt it was badly organized that they, they, that it wasn't just chip time. He couldn't, he couldn't understand this. And, and we were chatting about it and, and I was, um, I, I'm, I'd originally signed up to go in wave three, but I thought I really wanted to not put pressure on myself and I thought I might go back to wave four. But when I asked about that, they were a bit uncertain and you had to start in your wave. And again, he said to me, look, you don't take any chances, which was good advice. So I started in wave three, but wave one went off and it was 20 minutes late. Now the problem with that is that one is everybody's hanging around when it's colder for longer, which is not ideal, but also you're finishing when it's warmer. So again, it's not ideal and there are more people on the trail. So the trail that is, is shared, there's, there's cyclists and there's other people here and there, and, and the later in the day it goes, the more people there are. So, that, so the late start really wasn't ideal, but the, the, it went off in waves, so wave one, then wave two, and when it came to wave three, I was in wave three, um, <laughs> When we were supposed to go, all of a sudden, some of the pacers. Now there are pacers in the race, and and um, which is which is good, but they had parked themselves on right on the start line with a whole load of people, uh, and it was awkward getting in and around. And and uh, it, well, it's not a deal breaker, but it was awkward and uh, not ideal. But anyway, you start off and uh, you run the first four hundred meters towards the tunnel, and uh, I was really excited about this. Um, I really, really did enjoy that. I, it, that's well organized. That bit is good. Is that there's enough time um, to to sort yourselves out and all that jockeying position before the tunnel. Because once you get into the tunnel, um, you could you, a couple of people ran by here and there, but largely. And I, I've got a lot of uh, shots. I was busy filming in the tunnel. I, I, I really did. I was interested in, in doing that. And a lot of people running by. Um, I kept on the left. I did notice you're supposed to wear a headlamp or, or have a flashlight. I don't think they enforced that, but I think you were supposed to. But there was a guy uh, running beside me, and he had no uh, headlamp. And to be honest, I would have happily ran ran that way. But um, the atmosphere in the tunnel was really good. Um, there was somebody singing. There was hap someone said "Happy Birthday," so we sang "Happy Birthday" to somebody as we ran along. That was in the dark. It was that was really nice. And then you come out, and there was someone to collect the headlamps, so you handed your headlamps. I was deliberately trying to go slowly on the day. I was filming with an Insta, 
uh, Go2, I think it's the Minster 360 Go2, and I also with various uh, places to, to attach it to my cap and to my chest, and then I also had the iPhone that I was picking out here and there. And so I was using any excuse I had to stop to take pictures because I wanted to show what the race might be like, and I wasn't particularly interested in how long it was going to take me to run. Every now and then I looked at my watch just to just out of casual interest, but I ran at a pace I felt comfortable with, and I hoped that I would just make it through to the end. And so we headed on down. It was, um, there's a lot of, one of the things that I noticed immediately is you're running down the valley, down in the valley is, uh, you're on a sort of ridge, I guess, and down in the valley is um, I-90, which is the interstate that goes from Seattle all the way across to, to Boston on the East Coast. And you can hear a lot of, it has a constant noise from it. You can hear the trucks down shifting as they grind their way up through the valley on, on, on the interstate, which you've seen clips of. And um, yeah, that noise was always there and you ran down. I didn't know what to expect. I knew at some point in time there were some trestle bridges because I'd seen that on, on the website. And I think there might've been four of them. They were nice to run across. <laughs> I suffer from, uh, apart from the, the vertigo I got during the, the, the training, I, I suffer from a fear of heights and once or twice, and I, I also went to college with a lot of engineers who skipped lectures after nights out in Dublin. So, so I'm always slightly nervous. Uh, and, and, and so a couple of them I had to stay in, in the middle and just sort of co concentrate on going across. But they, they were pretty good. I was very excited because I knew that there was a hill coming at um, mile eight, I think they were promised a hill, and I it was a 15 foot hill. So I kept waiting to see this hill, and it finally arrived, and I was very happy to go up it because you're all, I'm always looking for a bit of variety on, on the marathon, and, and, and um, just constantly running on the same trail without any variety wouldn't be great. But I, I enjoyed running up the hill. Well, that's the big hill done. Ooh, where are we? 538, 14 k's in. Just run over that huge hill. Feels good. Yeah, feeling good. I enjoyed looking out over the valley many a times and the scenery was very beautiful. It was, uh, from my point of view, it was a bit like uh, running in Ireland in, 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 in Wicklow. It reminded me very much of that I, when I reviewed um, uh, some, some Atreyu trail shoes. Uh, it reminded me of that, but just the trees were taller and the mountains were bigger, but the atmosphere was, kind of similar and we went along there was a stations about every two miles and that was kind of good I stopped at most of them just to, to, I didn't I wasn't running for time so I took my time I didn't splash the stuff all over myself I um, one of the things I noticed was I got to one aid station and they weren't ready and, and you had to wait while they poured stuff that wasn't really very good um, but there was lots of aid stations and there were lots of toilets along the way that you could use yeah so far so good half marathon Nearly done. The watch says 21.51. And uh, 21.53. Thank you. The race just sort of went along. There's a thousand people in it. You never felt you were too close to people or too far away. But funny enough, it didn't really feel like a race. I know I was only trying to uh, finish it rather than, 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 than race hard, but, but uh, yeah, it sort of didn't, didn't, didn't feel atmospheric of race. There aren't many people there. Obviously, it's, it's out in the trail. There aren't, there aren't many people to uh, uh, support. There are more towards the end when you drop the two and a half thousand feet and you, you sort of go down towards the lake and then it sort of flattens out and um, yeah, you you notice it when it when when you don't notice the the, the, the slope when you're running it, but once it once it's no longer there, you did notice it. So that that was kind of interesting. I did, but I did enjoy the run down. And when there was more people, there was a bit more engagement, and it was nice to be out with their dogs and they were out with their friends and, and this and that and the other. Thank you very much for turning up with a lovely dog as well. One of the problems with the trail is is there are, I, I found there was a variety of cyclists on it and no matter how many signs there were that said cyclists yield to pedestrians, uh, they didn't. Uh, they ran at me at full speed. That was uh, more than annoying. Uh, they, they certainly uh, used some choice language at me, all of which I've heard before. Um, but, but yeah, that was, that was, uh, that was not pleasant. So, uh, I mean, you're, you're 60 years old, you're, you're doing your best to, to run as best as you can in there. Anyway, 
we crack on. But it, apart from that, uh, the race was enjoyable. You come in towards the end, you come in over a little river, which is very nice. And uh, I stopped again to take more pictures of that. There are some bridges towards the end, or you run under them, and I'd seen those from wrecking it the day before. I wrecked it the finish to see, you know, where it would be, because I knew I, I kind of wanted to film it. Um, and so I came to the bridges and I stopped, and then I tried the Insta360, the memory was full, so I tried with the iPhone, but I, <laughs> and I took a bit, I, I, I'll show some pictures, because it's completely jumbled. Uh, because I'm holding the iPhone, and then I'm realizing that I think I'll give it a go. Uh, I'm feeling really good. I, I did feel really good. So I, I decided I, I, I'd, I'd give it a whirl. And so anyway, I, I got up to a thousand watts. I couldn't believe it. Anyway, I, that's what the peak said on, on the Garmin, but I was flying along. The phone's going all over the place. The flags are fantastic. And actually at the finish line, it's lovely. People are all crammed in and it's, it's really lovely. And uh, you're flying along and people are cheering and, and all that sort of stuff. And so the, the footage will be crazy. I mean, it's all over the place. Uh, <laughs> right, well, how are we doing? Well, it's been out. Where's the camera? How you doing? Good there. Oh look, there's flags. Woohoo! There's a sort of inflatable thing. There's sort of people. They're cheering. Hello again. Yeah. This is going okay. Yeah. Hey, how you doing? We're nearly there. Oh yeah. Time to pick up the pace. And she's done. And, and then you cross the line and, and there was water, there was bananas. But then there was another uh, a disappointment. It was, it was, I'd have to find my head torch. And I don't know why, but, but everything was just, it wasn't thrown on the ground, it was laid on the ground. And it took, eight, it took me 20 minutes to find my headlamp. Now, of course, you're tired at the end of a marathon. And you're not as cognitively aware as you would be at the start. And, and I thought that was really not good. I mean, a simple trestle table where they could have laid them out would have been would have been nice. And people's gear bags were on the ground, and, and again, and you can see that clips of just people walking through the headlamps. They had to to try and find uh, their own. And uh, so, if I was doing it again, I, I really think they should have put a trestle table. But if I was doing it again, or advising you, or if you're thinking of doing it, get a unique bag. So they had out a bag. You could have had any bag to put to put it in. A unique bag with a unique color would would have helped. And the same, you, you cross the line and um, I, I found it really hard to find where I'd get my f finishing t-shirt. They give you the medal when you go over. It was very nice. Again, something I saw in Berlin where you, you pop your head down, someone puts it over. I really enjoyed that. Um, but it was really hard to find where the t-shirts, and when you ask anybody, nobody seemed to know where the buses were, where it was, it really wasn't very well organized. Uh, when I ran Buckeye, Arizona, it was organized by Start Line Racing. It was really well organized. I, I didn't feel this was a, a well organized marathon at all. Um, and then, so, you, so then you have to go and you try and find the shirt and then you get the shirt and, and um, it turns out you could have got it the day before at the pickup, but I didn't know that. Did No one explained it particularly well. And, and then the shirt, I, all the shirts that I run in um, are all medium, all my marathon shirts. This one is medium, but it's, it's really tight. It's actually a vest. And um, yeah, so, so size up. And also one of the things that, this was a slight annoyance for me, but maybe it's just me. Um, they all say marathon and half marathon, and they don't say the year. And again, in the Jack and Jill marathon, it's even though there was half marathons and one kilometer races, you got a shirt for that year and for that distance. And that was just a nicer touch. The medal itself is nice. It's it's big and chunky, and I think it's based on the doors of the of the um, the tunnel. So yeah, then there was the, the, the bus ride back. I, I really enjoyed the bus ride uh, to and from on, on the way back. And I was sitting on seats with, um, uh, two guys, one who was the fastest over 70 finisher and the other guy was the second fastest over 70 finisher. And that gave me a lot of, uh, a lot of joy sitting be beside people thinking that, yeah, maybe I could still be doing this in another 10 years time. Then I went to the farm and made a quick, uh, 
piece to camera. Recording, recording. That was kind of funny standing out in the, in the farm trying to, trying to. I'm trying to learn how to do these kind of things um, because the New York Marathon is coming up, and I wanted to learn how to to vlog a bit better because that that was my plan for that marathon. But so I went back, made a piece of camera in the field, and uh, then drove back. Uh, I was expecting to get a lot of pain in the car. I didn't. Uh, and uh, I drove back to the hotel where it's funny at the end of most marathons um, or not most marathons but certainly the early marathons I did I feel a little uh, nauseous at the end and I might feel a little dizzy in front of my eyes but I didn't feel any of that uh, in fact I felt great <laughs> I had, uh, I don't know, I just felt great. I didn't have any problems with my kit. The vest was perfect, so it was the right thing to do because the temperature was fine in the morning. I wore a Garmin chest strap. That was absolutely uh, perfect. I, I had the Stride um, foot pod, but I was playing around with the watch trying to convert <laughs> kilometers to miles because in the tunnel, the GPS went off. I could tell that, and every now and then, I, I would, I would uh, try and get Siri to, to give me some conversions so I could see, accurate conversions so I could see how far off. My GPS was off by maybe half a kilometer, but consistently more or less from the start. So that was kind of uh, slightly tricky, but I kept asking Siri to, to calculate. But what happened was I ended up turning off the, the stride. It was fine. And and also had the ultra human uh, air ring, which are ring air, which is charging over there. Um, but I was I was using all of those for data, but, but the Garmin was pretty reliable and so, yeah, it was uh, it was really nice to finish. I finished without any pain. I I, I just took it handy, and um, yeah, made the piece to camera. When I went back to the hotel, I was neither hungry nor thirsty. Which is, I drank uh, 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 five hundred milliliters of water or whatever at the finish. They were handy set, and a chocolate milk. I love chocolate milk. <laughs> I wasn't thirsty, but I just wanted chocolate milk. Um, and so then I went off for some, some pizzas and a couple of PLS, but I was, I was fine. I, 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 I was surprised that I'm always surprised at the end of a marathon that I'm not hungry. And uh, I'm always surprised I'm not all that thirsty. And I'm always, I was surprised this time because I wasn't sleepy. Um, usually you'd, you'd, you'd nip and have a, have a, have a, have an, um, have a nap, but I didn't. And uh, one of the things that I found was the Morton again, I used Morton gel, um, it was fine. I, I skipped a gel. Same thing happened in Rotterdam. No matter, I was trying to take them every 6K and I ended up with one at the end and I couldn't, I couldn't, couldn't figure it out. You know, because you're cognitively not as good at the end as you might be at the start. I couldn't figure it out. I, the, there comes a point in time, uh, Morton has been perfect for me. I had zero GI issues in 10 marathons or nine of them I ran with Morton. Uh, and I've had no, no problems whatsoever. I just find it bland. But, it, but, I, but I do find it really good i'd highly recommend it if you're looking for performance on day and uh, it was uh, yeah and again i didn't cross the finish line hungry or thirsty or or uh, have any toilet issues Not, nothing like that with all all that worked well so what did i learn by running the jack and jill marathon 2023 well i signed up for the race because it had a reputation as a boston qualifier and had a reputation for being scenic. So we'll deal with the, the two separately. Regarding the Boston qualifier, I had already Boston qualified, and um, so I wasn't, and because of an injury, I, 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 that wasn't an issue for me. I wasn't trying to Boston qualify. I don't know how many people um, Boston qualified. I, I, I don't know, it'd be interesting to see the stats. But if I look at my Garmin, my average pace was 555, but my average moving pace was 547 per kilometer. And so, because I was stopping a lot to take, uh, make pieces to camera and, and film and all that. But my average grade adjusted pace was 604 per kilometer. So I was getting about a, according to Garmin, about a 10 second advantage per kilometer on the run. And that could make a difference between Boston qualifying or not. For me, I wouldn't uh, feel comfortable. I'm not as experienced running on these type of trails as other people might be, but I would find it hard to put down the power consistently without worrying about odd stones where you could roll your foot. And there was a lot of those around the place. And so that, uh, I'm not so convinced that this is a great Boston qualifier, but that's just me. It could be that other people had a, had a much different experience, but for me, I wouldn't pick this marathon for a Boston qualifier. As for the scenery, it's lovely. I mean, it is. It. I mean, running in that tunnel was really, really special, and uh, it's obviously unique. But it was really special. And then when you come out, and um, the noise in the valley was a, was a bit uh, annoying and, and distracted a little bit. Um, but it was a, a nice marathon to run for the type of running I was trying to do, which was essentially a long 
training run. And from that point of view, it is kind of like that. There, there is the, there's not always the feeling that you're in a race because there's there's, there's almost nobody around you. Um, there's a feeling uh, that it is a nice long scenic run. And if, if you want a nice long scenic run with an amazing tunnel at the start, then yeah, this is a marathon, it's well worth running. After the race, I stayed in Issaquah and then I came into Seattle. Uh, the day after, I dropped the car back. I did what I did at the start. I videoed the car um, at the start. So if you're hiring a car, so you have an idea of the damage before and after, I always do that. And then I uh, stayed, I'm here in the Radisson Hotel by the airport, which is nicer than the Crown Plaza as it happens, uh, much more modern and uh, perfectly suited for my needs. I, uh, I stayed, uh, it was great. I, I saw my old friend Jack, I haven't seen Jack since school, and I left in 1980. So it was very nice to see Jack, and Jack, we went cycling around. It was, we were cycling around, um, and I'm not good on a bicycle, even though I love watching bike racing. I, I had a, um, that was when I noticed my, my, my uh, back and leg were at me again, but that's soon passed, but it was really good to see him. Then I saw my friend, Colm, who I shared my 21st with and haven't seen. Well, I've seen him a few times, but we were in college together. So that was really good to see some old friends. I saw a baseball game. I saw the, the Seattle beat the, the Red Sox. And it was just, it was great. A couple of days and fly home a bit later. I go to celebrate one of my favorite chocolates is by Tony. And uh, this is the Ben and Jerry's version of Tony. So yeah, nice to celebrate the marathon with uh, Colm and Jack and Tony and Ben and Jerry and uh, well, you so yeah it's uh onwards to the next one new york 2023 here we come thanks for watching